Well, thank you so much for the very kind invite and an invite back. I know when I was here last time, we were right in the middle of the grand finale orbits, and things were insane, probably including me. You know, <laughs> uh, who was here for the astrobiology talk uh, over at the other campus? Okay, so there will be a lot of duplicates there. Uh, this was these two talks kind of came together, uh, uh, sort of as a set, <clears throat> but a, f a few new things. So there's a few new things. <clears throat> So uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about the legacy of the Cassini spacecraft. But uh, before we can talk about the legacy, we need to talk a little bit about what the spacecraft is and where it went and what was its mission. Uh, the Cassini spacecraft is named after two uh, famous astronomers, Jean Dominique Cassini, that's the orbiter, the Cassini orbiter, and Christian Huygens, the, the probe. Uh, and in fact, this then is the first legacy of the Cassini mission. When we look back now that the mission is over and we say, what is it that Cassini did that was extraordinarily great? Um, and in, of course, there's going to be great science. There's going to be all those things. But one of the things I think we can look back now sort of with 30 years of perspective is it was forging the relationship with the European Space Agency. Uh, nowadays, you hear about a Mars mission going off to Mars, the InSight. How many people got up at 4 a.m. to watch InSight? Oh, people, cool stuff is happening all around you. You need to pay attention. It's very cool. Uh, yeah, so homework assignment to everybody is to go find that uh, a long exposure picture that they took from Mount Wilson, just this red, beautiful streak across the sky. Of course, I was standing in my backyard at 4 a.m. 4 a.m. is not a good time for me. And uh, my sister, who's a nurse, 4 a.m. is a fine time for her. Um, and I'm like, okay, so Vandenberg is sort of to the north or to the east or to the west. And she's like, okay, so you should be looking over there. And she says, well, what about that red streak through the sky there? And I'm like, oh, yeah, that would be it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, like I said, 4 a.m., not the best time for me. But uh, when we partner now with the European Space Agency on a mission like InSight, it is taken for granted that that is a good idea, that that will be successful, that we know how to work together. Uh, and that was certainly not the case with the Cassini mission when it first started. And it was a big deal to the Europeans to have such an important role in such a major uh, flagship mission. So the first legacy of the Cassini mission is this partnership uh, with the European Space Agency. Um, okay, let me see if I've got the... Okay, wait, wait, wait. Yeah. Okay, so the Cassini spacecraft is quite large. Here it is. There's a person to give you some perspective. Stands about 22 feet tall. The high gain antenna up here is about four uh, feet, four meters. Ugh. Okay, words have got to come out correctly when I'm giving a public talk. <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's printed right there. Four meters in diameter. Uh, if it was here in the room, sort of like these people right here, this would be about how big uh, the high gain antenna is. And you'll notice that all the instruments sort of fit behind the high gain antenna. You could tuck in behind that, and the high gain antenna can protect them from either solar radiation or impacts, and we'll get to that as part of our story later. The Huygens probe here, built and operated uh, by the European Space Agency, again, uh, went to a mission, drift out of Titan, we'll talk about that too. Uh, let's see, almost 3,000 kilograms of propellant uh, at the beginning of the mission, but this was in fact the mission limiting uh, consumable, was the amount of fuel that we had. And power at launch, we have radioisotope thermoelectric generators. They started at 875 watts, and they were at 633 watts at the end of mission. We had a huge, gigantic, massive 0.5 gigabyte recorder. Uh, I came from Voyager, where I can't even tell you what it is, uh, how small it is over there. Uh, and I thought, oh my gosh, it's so big, we'll never fill it up. That's, as you all know, that's ridiculous, right? Uh, what is it? Uh, in, uh, expenses rise to meet income. And data n n desired by scientists rises to meet the size of the solid state recorder. <coughs> and the, the Huygens probe, which we're going to talk about today. All right. Uh, can we dim the lights a little bit more? Is that possible? Also, there's like buttons up here. I don't know if that helps or not. But Yay! Yes, and yeah, you don't need to, you need to see them, not me. Yeah. All right, uh, well, I already talked about our partnership with the European Space Agency, and that is where all of our international uh, affiliations came from, which was fantastic. So we'll go on. Uh, Cassini was launched, just to give you a sense of the mission, Cassini was launched in 1997. 
I'm just trying to think how, like, people who are in college now, were you born in 1997? <sighs> okay, I'm feeling old. Um, this is a, uh, a launch video up here. We don't really need to hear it. He's just going to do a countdown. Uh, it was a night launch, the largest rocket that the U.S. was currently launching on. It was gorgeous, and I wasn't there. I was in California instead of Florida. I'm not bitter about it, though. I've let it go. Um, yeah, this beautiful cloud deck, beautiful cloud deck. It went behind the cloud deck. Everybody thought, oh, my God, it's going to, it blew up behind the cloud deck, but it didn't. Because when it gets behind the clouds, it's sort of the light gets all filtered, and everybody thought it had blown up there. So, yeah, but then, of course, it emerged. Yeah, a friend uh, took this picture for me and sent it. Not that, you know, we have a game of one-upmanship or anything like that. I'm not saying that we do. I'm just saying, you know, that that's a rotten thing to do to somebody when this is the picture they have. It was a great launch, though. We circled around the Earth solar system to get out to Saturn in a blistering seven years. We used uh, gravitational assist to do that. <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and stop the movie because the movie is just, you know, it's exciting, but it's not that exciting. And we got out to Saturn in seven years. Now, remember that Saturn goes around the sun once every 30 years. So the seasons at Saturn are seven years long. Summer lasts for seven years. Winter lasts for seven years. Fall lasts for seven years, right? When we got out there, it was, think of it as the equivalent of mid-January, sort of northern winter in the, in the northern hemisphere. We had a four-year prime mission. That four-year prime mission took us out to 2008. We then requested uh, from headquarters and the U.S. government to have a fully funded extended two-year mission that would get us out basically to April, right? April, so we could get out to the equinox. And then we requested a second extension, this time a seven-year extension, basically to get us out to summer solstice. And then the, 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 the glaze on top of the cherry, on top of the whipped cream, on top of the icing, on top of the cake, was these uh, proximal orbits at the end, which were just uh, incredible, the opportunity that they presented us in terms of disposing of the spacecraft, but also the science that we could do. So that's basically uh, where the mission uh, is in its whole life. Of course, when I gave this talk before, the spacecraft was executing the proximal orbits, and now, of course, the, the spacecraft is gone. We did crash into Saturn on September 15th of last year. So you're going to spend the spacecraft out to Saturn. A giant spacecraft would fill this room. What are you going to do with it? Well, there's basically five big things you want to go after. You want to go after the planet itself. It's one of our wonderful gas giant planets. It's fabulous. We can learn a lot about it. There's the rings best ring system in the whole uh, solar system, I almost said galaxy, <laughs> in the whole solar system. Uh, just absolutely fabulous. If you want to study the physics of disk systems, you want to be studying Saturn's rings. You can learn a lot about how moons and ring particles interact. Uh, just absolutely fabulous. If you want to think about and learn about and study galaxy formation or solar system formation, that's all the physics of disk systems. Uh, there are, of course, icy satellites. In particular, you could see uh, probably what co comes to be one of the most important icy satellites in the Saturn system, which is Titan. To give you a sense of the size, Titan's about the size of the United States. The other moon we're going to talk about is Enceladus, right here, and that's about the size of Iowa, just to give you a sense. <clears throat> so you're going to talk, of, you're going to go there, you're going to study the planet, the rings, the icy satellites, but in particular Titan, and also the giant magnetic bubble uh, that surrounds Saturn. And I already told you that. See if I'd only paid attention to my own slides. OK, so Titan. We're going to spend a few minutes on Titan, because there is no question that in terms of the Cassini legacy, uh, the exploration of Titan stands, you could, you could argue it stands alone as the top uh, result of the mission. There are scientists who will tell you that it is Enceladus, and they don't have a crappy argument. Uh, I, of course, having spent now a decade doing Titan, I'm probably a little biased, just a little bit. I'm still going to go with Titan as the number one, but Enceladus is making a real run for it, so, as you'll hear. So uh, Titan is a moon the size of the United States. It's one of the largest moons in the solar system. But what makes it interesting is that it is completely enshrouded in a thick atmosphere. It's enshrouded in an atmosphere thicker than the atmosphere that you're embedded in right now. Right now, you're embedded in something that's, you know, what, 75%? Uh, uh, nitrogen, right? Yes, God. 
For a minute, I forgot the atmosphere of the Earth. Okay. Yeah, then you've got a, like another 25% that's oxygen, and then you've got a little mush in there. In uh, Titan, what you have is 98% nitrogen and 2% uh, methane. And methane is a chemical element that is CH4. That means it's one carbon, four hydrogen. The thing that makes that interesting is that when sunlight, in particular UV light, hits methane, it breaks that up into the C's and the H's. And then th through all the sort of chemistry that happens when you have a lot of C's and H's running around, those recombine. They never recombine back into methane. You never get CH4 again. But you get a whole bunch of other things. You know, C2H6, C3H, C numeral, H numeral. Titan's atmosphere is filled with this kind of stuff. And that's ethane and acetylene and propane and benzene. That's what those kind of chemicals are. They're very rich in sort of um, interesting chemistry in terms of you know, sort of astrobiologically interesting. Uh, the, the group of them t collectively are called uh, tholins. Uh, it's not a hard, fast rule. People call them other things. Hmm? Yes, yes, yeah. And uh, so uh, Voyager flew by. This uh, Voyager uh, flew by back in the 80s. And they saw the tops of the clouds because Voyager, they knew about the methane and they knew about the atmosphere. What they didn't know is that it was 98% nitrogen and the methane was suspended in the atmosphere. And you guys live near Los Angeles. I do not need to tell you what happens when you suspend junk in the atmosphere. You can't see through it. Bum. <laughs> so when we took our instruments, we very deliberately took instruments based on that Voyager experience that would allow us to see down to the surface. And this is what the surface of Titan looks like. And I just want you to take this in for a second. You know, think about what, like, what your mental model is, what the, vision, the picture that you have of Earth's moon, right? Heavily cratered, no atmosphere, basically dead. This doesn't look like that at all. If you can even see a crater on here, I'd be shocked. This looks very much like the Earth, right? You could say, just looking at it, I, uh, I totally recognize this. So this could be like Spain, uh, you know, and France, and England, and Ireland, right? That means this is the ocean, or, 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 this is the eastern seaboard of the United States, and Florida's missing, and this is the ocean. You don't know, right? You don't know what's high, you don't know what's low, you don't know, but it looks Earth-like. It's got clouds that are changing very dynamically over the course of the few hours that we took these observations. So of course Titan is an Earth-like body. Uh, this is a picture taken from the opposite side with a different camera. This camera is a little bit lower resolution, but the benefit of this camera is it takes the picture in 255 different wavelengths. And that way we can actually isolate things like water, which then we color uh, blue. Uh, or wait, do we color water red? Just a second. This is what happens when you have a two-hour drive. Just give me a second. OK, it's not coming. Homework assignment to everybody to go off and figure out the VIMS filters. Um, you, make color, <laughs> you make color pictures based on different wavelengths. And it can pull out things like chemical composition. So you can see here different chemical compositions. Like this thing, whatever it is, is very interesting. It's quite unique on the surface uh, of Titan. Whereas this dark stuff here is dark there as well. It has a little tint of blue. It has a little tint of uh, water. But water covered up with tholins. OK, so, oh my gosh, I need to update this picture. Um, this is 2015. Of course, we have a slightly updated picture. So here's, here's that picture you just saw there. There's, you know, like I said, Spain, France, Great Britain. Um, everything that you see that is dark here are dunes. And everything that you see that's dark at the poles are lakes. OK, now just, we, just, we just need to take a step back and unpack that, because that is an incredible thing that I just said there. OK, we know how dunes are formed here on the Earth, right? Dunes on the Earth, I mean, we know how things happen on the Earth, right? We have plate tectonics, and we have giant mountain ranges, and things fall off the mountain ranges. Giant boulders fall off the mountain ranges, right? And when we have volcanoes, like in Hawaii right now, you know, the mountains are made out of rocks. When we have volcanoes, liquid rock oozes out onto the surface of the, of the Earth, right? That's how new Earth is created. OK, then these giant rocks fall onto the ground. They get beaten by the atmosphere in the rain. They break up into pieces. They fall into the river. And they get tumbled by the river, right? And they get rounded. Smooth river rocks get rounded. Little chips have come off of them. 
the river rushes those little chips down to the delta, and then over eons, when things change, the deltas dry up, those little chips of, of rock get picked up by the winds and they get blown into the desert, and that's what makes the sands of the desert, right? It's one way that we form the sands of the desert. That happens on Titan too, but it's so cold in Titan, the water is frozen. So on Titan, the mountains are made out of frozen water. Frozen water. And when you have things that fall off, giant icebergs fall off of the mountains. And then it breaks up into things, and ice cubes fall in to the river. And the river, of course, isn't liquid water. The river is liquid natural gas. It's ethane and methane. And it tumbles the ice cubes down, and it rounds them. Little chips of water ice come off. They get rushed down to the deltas. They get dried out and then blown by the winds of Titan. And everything you see here that's dark are dunes. Dunes just like the dunes of the Arabian Desert. They're dunes a couple hundred meters high, a couple hundred meters across, that go for a thousand miles. And they're basically little chips of water ice covered in the hydrocarbon goo that comes from the chemistry in the atmosphere. Now, do you guys have like goosebumps? You should have goosebumps right now because that's really a goosebump thing. Okay, just checking, just checking. Um, up here in the northern uh, poles and the southern poles, everything that you see dark up there are actually lakes and rivers and seas, but not of water, of, of methane and ethane. Uh, this is just a wonderful picture of the great northern seas here, Kraka Mare, Legia Mare. Uh, I think I have a close-up. Oh, okay, I don't have a close-up. Okay, the Huygens probe. Okay, wait, I have to set up the Huygens probe. Sorry, go back. Okay. Okay, um, so I said in the beginning that one of the legacies of the Cassini mission was our partnership with ESA, and they built the Huygens probe. The Huygens probe was designed to come in, drift down through the atmosphere, and land on the surface of Titan. Its mission was supposed to last a few hours and was going to happen early in the Cassini mission, so 2004, 2005. It was, uh, you know, no suspense here, tremendously successful. Um, so we had piggybacked it out there for all those years, seven years to get out to Saturn. We put ourselves on a collision course with Titan and ejected the Huygens probe. The Huygens probe, of course, is going to hit the top of that atmosphere, and it is going screaming fast. So the first thing that happens is the heat shield helps slow the spacecraft down. And it gets very hot inside of the, uh, uh, behind the heat shield. I mean, the heat shield protects it from, this is 19,000 degrees Fahrenheit out here. It's still hot, though, on the inside. That's important because that's one of the ways we made sure that no earth bugs got down under the surface of Titan. We had one parachute that pulled off the back. Then we had another second parachute. This was a, a parachute that was designed to pull the spacecraft out of the heat shield here. <clears throat> now, if we'd state now here, all the instruments of the Huygens probe are exposed to the instrument, are exposed to the atmosphere. They're all it's spinning. You could see the spacecraft is spinning and it's drifting down. If we'd stayed under the big parachute, we only would have made it through the top 10% of the atmosphere. So we had to eject this parachute and have a smaller parachute. All the while, we're radioing data back to the Cassini orbiter. So, I mean, this is an exciting time and a mission. And one of the things I like to impress upon people is, uh, you know, you, many of you are college students right now. You're in the midst of an endeavor that's going to take you four years or so to get through it. And you think to yourself, oh my God, four years. Oh, I don't, uh, there's no instant gratification in this process, right? It's four years. Okay, these scientists worked for 20 years to get two hours of data, okay? I want you to put it in perspective. And of course, what did they see? Clouds, 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 clouds. And then they started to see some exciting stuff. And if you want to see excited scientists, go to a place where they've invested most of their professional career in something that happens over the course of a couple of hours. It was pretty exciting. I wasn't there. I was at the U.S. Figure Skating Championships. That's a tale for another day. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But by the way, that sets a very high bar, right, for every U.S. Figure Skating Championships to come. I'm like, is what you're asking me to do more important than the Huygens landing? I don't think so. <laughs> so let's see the surface of. So now, just look at this for a second. Again, this is one of those moments that you pause. This is a picture taken by a robot that we built, humans built. We landed it on a moon a billion miles away. We took a picture out into the surface of this moon, and it really should give you goosebumps. That's really an incredible, incredible endeavor uh, to be successful in that. Uh, many people talk about the space program as sort of the cathedrals uh, of our generation, and I completely agree with that analogy. It's you know thousands and thousands and thousands of work hours uh, to get this thing that is um, that speaks to the humanity in us. But remember, 
Hey, wait a minute. You can go. Okay, just a second. Thank you. Um, remember, these rocks here, they look like rounded river pebbles and stones. Those are, remember, those are ice, frozen ice. Remember. Okay. I wanted to show you a close-up of the, of the seas, uh, which we know are, are filled with liquid uh, ethane and methane. Uh, this is actually a methane-rich lake here. But look at that little canyon that comes into it. I mean, like I said, you don't even have to be a geologist to know that's kind of what lakes uh, on the Earth look like. If you ever get a chance, go look at a, a Google image of like Lake Mead, right? It's just like that. Also, you could tell that there's different uh, layers in the in these level of the of the lake. Uh, you can just see it from the from the radar scattering. And of course, we had a beautiful specular reflection off of the the lakes with the sunlight. Yeah, fantastic. Of course, we're geeks. We immediately contacted lakeart.com. I only wish I had been part of this conversation. So this is a company in Minnesota, and they make lakes for all the Minnesota lakes and stuff like that. So my friend calls him up and says, oh, you know, I can't find the lake I'm looking for in your catalog. Can you help me? And, 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 the, and the gentleman on the line is very kind. He says, of course, we can help you. Um, what county is it in? Um, well, it's really not any county. Uh, it's, and he says, well, is it, what country? Well, it's not really in a country. And he says, okay, where is this lake? He says, well, this is a lake on the moon Titan going around Saturn. And then he just bursts into laughter. He says, are you kidding me? She says, I am totally not. I work for NASA, and I'd like you to do this lake. <laughs> and she said, he says, hold on a sec. i got to get my boss. So his bo the boss comes over, and then they're chatting with him. And they did this uh, Ligia Mare. And of course, we all, what, seven seconds later, we're ordering clocks and wall art. <laughs> I'm just saying lakeart.com if you're interested. <laughs> Because, uh, see, I work with geeks. Well, I am a geek. I really shouldn't. No shame there. No shame there. OK. Um, OK, I did mention Titan's atmosphere, but I wanted to really sort of emphasize the chemistry behind that uh, conversation. If you were to take our ion and neutral mass spectrometer, and every time we flew by Titan, we flew through the top of the atmosphere. And if you were to take our instrument and fly through the top of Jupiter or Mars or Earth or Venus, this is what you would see. This is what you see at Titan. OK. so. Yes, it is the most chemically complex uh, ionosphere in the solar system. And the law, very strong connections uh, to, to uh, neutral chemistry. Uh, this, this whole, I mean, this is PhDs for years with the chemists trying to understand uh, the chemistry in Titan's atmosphere. OK, so when we look at the legacy of the Cassini mission, that's what we're here to talk about today. The first legacy is partnering with the European Space Agency. The second legacy is, of course, one of our great science results, uh, the one about Titan. Titan being one of the most complete worlds uh, out there for us to study. It's a world whose interior surface atmosphere is coupled through volatile cycling. That's what the atmosphere. And we, we have dunes, and we have rivers, and mountains, and great chemistry. It's just, it's unbelievable, right? So. Um, I still put Titan as the number one uh, science result of the mission, but uh, why is that note here? Just a second. Oh, I was giving a talk to Chevron people. <laughs> 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 and so I said, well, this is interesting, right? Titan has hundreds of times more liquid hydrocarbons than all the known oil and gas reserves. Here's the reference if you're interested. Uh, and of course, you should be you know, funding missions to Titan because, you know, I'm just saying. That was. Yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> uh, OK, so I, I told you how incredible it is that Titan is sort of a, a complete world with volatile cycling. I just want to make sure that you put it in the correct uh, neighborhood, right? Even though it's a moon of a giant satellite, uh, and you might think of it as a moon, it's perfectly appropriate. I mean, that's not wrong. But really, the family of bodies that you should associate Titan with are the inner planets of the solar system, right? There are only four worlds in our uh, solar system that have significant atmospheres. And if you put them sort of in context, there is Venus, Titan, Earth, Mars. I mean, we let Mars be in the crew, crew you know, in the club because they would get mad if we didn't, but you know. Um, they're very, they're very sensitive, you know. <laughs> the Mars people. Uh, we have a nice, healthy relationship at JPL, the Mars community versus the outer planets community. Uh, so sometimes they're in the lead. Sometimes we're in the lead. It, it goes different ways. But uh, Titan, you should definitely think of Titan uh, in this world, or it, sort of with these worlds as a comparison, because really only two of these worlds right, are complete, uh, where that, that cycling is going on. 
Uh, the other two really don't have that. So it's really Earth and Titan. And it's quite possible that Titan is an example of the most common body in the universe, right? There'll be more Titans than anything else. <clears throat> okay, making a run for science highlight number two. Now, if you would have asked me five years ago or 10 years ago, I would have said, <laughs> sure, whatever. You could put yourself as number two. You're so distant. Why are we even talking, right? But uh, Enceladus, <laughs> Enceladus has come on strong, okay? They have made a great case uh, that they are, in fact, the best science result that has come out of the mission. Uh, <clears throat> I, will, I will lay it in front of you, and, and, and really there's no wrong answer here. They're both great science results. So this is a picture that was taken of Enceladus uh, once, we, once we got there, sort of in the early days. These tiger stripes here uh, will become important because it's out of the tiger stripes that we learned that there are shooting water geysers uh, out of the tiger stripes. Okay, so again, let's take a moment. Shooting water geysers. How many places in the solar system have those? Two. Earth, right, Yellowstone and Enceladus. It's possible that Europa has them, but not definitive yet. Okay, uh, you're shooting water geysers out of your south pole for a long time. What happens? You leave a lot of material uh, in your orbit. And of course, the E-ring, named completely coincidentally E-ring, didn't know it was caused by Enceladus at the time. Um, the E-ring, and you can even see uh, the plume sort of modifying the E-ring sort of in real time. Uh, this was an exciting discovery on the mission. when. When you don't know, that, I mean, see, like, I just laid it out for you, like, oh, isn't this cool? There it is. Bing, bang, bada boom, right? But, I mean, this is not how it happened on the mission, right? On the mission, I mean, we knew Enceladus was kind of exciting. Of the half a dozen or a dozen flybys we were going to do in those first four years, we were going to go to Enceladus three times, right? We knew it was pretty cool. The very first time we flew by, this would have been in February of 2005. So, like, literally last month, we had the Huygens landing on Titan. Okay, Huygens landing on Titan, and the next month we're doing this Enceladus flyby. I don't even think we had it on our radar screen to pay attention to it that much, right? I mean, it was good, but everybody's analyzing the Titan data. So we fly by Enceladus, and it's a pretty distant flyby, but the magnetometer team comes back and says, there is something that is causing Saturn's magnetic field to deviate around this moon. Now, that doesn't happen in dead moons. When you're going to deviate a magnetic field, you have to have moving electrons to do that, okay? You have to have some sort of ions or some sort of electrons that are doing that. Dead moons don't do this. And the PI of the magnetometer instrument flew all the way out to the United States from, Mag from uh, London to have a meeting with the other scientists about Enceladus. And she made the argument that we only have three of these flybys, and one of them is in June, and then we don't have another one for a couple of years. We cannot waste that June flyby. We need to change the trajectory, the trajectory that all of us have been working on for five years at this point. We need to change the trajectory in the course of a few months to go closer. And her scientific arguments were so compelling that the, that the navigation team did it. Of course, they didn't do it on the first, you know, the first round. The first round, engineers always say no. Um, <laughs> and project management always says no. That's their job. And then you have to convince them that this is the right thing to do. So then in July of 2014, is when we took that picture that I showed a minute ago. This was the first result that came back because the camera's very easy to process their data. You know, your eyes are just popping out of your head. It was 8.30 a.m. on a, I'm pretty sure it was a Monday. We were having a telecon where everybody was presenting their data. And, you know, here are these giant cracks. And they're colored different. And, and oh my gosh, what's happening? And then the thermal instrument, who'd expected to see sort of a little warm spot where the sunlight hits Enceladus, is seeing a hot spot at the South Pole. And, you know, you know it's very cold, water's frozen, uh, and they're getting, you know, like, you know, 15, 20, 30 degrees here difference in this, sort of this area as a whole. By the next time we got together, the next day at 8.30 a.m., uh, they had laid out pixel by pixel where the heat was coming from, and it was coming from the cracks. And the instrument who was supposed to fly uh, the ion and neutral mass spectrometer that we use on Titan to tell chemistry that we fly through, they reported on Monday that they had, something had gone wrong. Their instrument hadn't worked properly. The data is perhaps garbage, but they don't understand it at all. And we're all, oh my gosh, that, that is sad. Another instrument, which is the ultraviolet instrument, had had uh, a, a great day. In February, they had watched a star drift behind Enceladus. And they had seen exactly what you expect to see when you have a dead moon, right? Starlight, 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 boom, right when you get to the 
edge of the moon. But this time, it was a different star, and the trajectory was different. And this is what they saw this time. Starlight, 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 trickling off starlight, and then boom. Trickling off starlight means that there's something in between you and the star that's scattering some of the light. There is a material at the South Pole. So now we have these giant cracks. We have a hot spot. We have material. You know, you're starting to, like, get goosebumps on these telecons, and then the ion neutral mass spectrometer comes up on the next day and says, oh wait, our instrument wasn't broken at all. We flew through a water cloud, completely saturated the instrument. That's what happened. We flew through a water cloud. At this point, you know, they're getting ready to have, you know, like massive, uh, you know, press conferences and stuff, and this is when I personally came to hate the JPL media team because they did not understand the scope of what was happening here and they did not know how to handle it. And, uh, and to this day, one of my great regrets is that the media team did not, was not able to communicate to the public how amazing this was, right? This was, this was an incredible week in, this, in the lifetime of this mission, which was an incredible mission in the lifetime of missions. And it was too bad they didn't appreciate that. Was the water actually involved here? H2O? Mm-hmm, yep. Here, yeah. So here's a, here's a little movie here. You could see jets, jets. And then I think I have the, uh, here it is. 91% water, H2O, with about 3% carbon dioxide, and then uh, nitrogen and methane and carbon. And then a, a bunch of other stuff was detected as well. So, I mean, that's a pretty amazing result. You have geysers shooting out of the South Pole with a brew of volatile gases, water vapor, carbon dioxide. And, and just, uh, just so you know, to, uh, this organic material, always with the organic material uh, in, the, in the two bodies we've been talking about, right? Because the organic material is what makes it interesting to the astrobiological community. Okay, so we've had many other flybys of Enceladus. We've gotten much, much better at taking these images. And now we're at the point where we're mapping uh, down, to where we're actually aligning the pixel on the hot spot. And when you do that, you get up to, you know, not just 85K, you know, you start to get up to 170K. Now this is interesting because that's about the temperature that when you add antifreeze to water, it keeps it liquid, right? That when you start getting into temperature ranges like that. Okay, so what else is happening? Well, there's that giant E-ring out there, right? And we have a dust detector. We've been flying through the E-ring for years and years and years and years. What have we learned? Well, one of the things we learned is that we're getting some really interesting results of the material that's in the E-ring, which we know is coming from the plumes on Enceladus. And one of the things is it's salt grains, right? The CDA, that's our dust detector, uh, detects small salt grains. Uh, also, they detected these very, very tiny nanoparticles. Uh, they're about uh, between six and nine nanometers. Not more than 10, not less than six, a very small range of little round silicate balls, right? And that's very interesting. That'll be part of our story in a minute. Okay, we've also had a chance for the radio science team to try to probe the interior of the body. And after a few uh, flybys, they confirmed a local ocean. And after 13 years of flybys, they got even a handful more. They were able to confirm a global ocean underneath. So now we're starting to get in some pretty interesting, sorry, I don't want to talk about that. We're starting to get into some pretty interesting territory, right? We have a global ocean underneath a thick ice shell. The ocean is hot because it's, it's powering the geysers. Geysers that you've already seen with your eyes. This is Iowa. Those geysers were shooting out the, 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 across the state of Iowa, right? I mean, those are huge geysers, the gas that's coming from that. Um, we know that there's salt in there. We know that there's a complex mixture of volatiles. We know that there's excess methane. We know that there's these little silicate nanograins, right? This is starting to become a very interesting conversation, right? How, why is there excess methane? Why are there these little nanograins? What's going on, right? So we know that the water is hot down there. It's getting super saturated with the silicates. You know, what could cause the little nanograins? What could cause the excess methane? And when you start to put it together, you start to realize that you do actually have like a hot thermal vent at the base. And when you take something hot that's super saturated with silicates and you shoot it out of a cold crack and it becomes solid very, very quickly, that's where you get the little nanograins, right? If it was a slow shooting out, the, the grains would get much bigger and they clog it up. If it was a fast shooting out, they wouldn't get that big, right? It's telling you something about the heat and it's telling you something about how fast the material is moving. So there's a strong possibility that we've got this hot ocean now uh, in Enceladus. 
and you know, ongoing seafloor hydrothermal activity. I mean, just take those words in. This is a planetary scientist standing in front of you talking about ongoing seafloor hydrothermal activity. Right? That's totally Earth-like. That's exactly what you would expect. That's the words they use when we study vents at the bottom of the ocean. And everywhere we study vents at the bottom of the ocean, what do we find? We find life. Right? And what does life need to exist in, in down there at the bottom of the ocean? It needs food. And that food can't be sunlight. That food is hydrogen. And guess what one of the last things Cassini found when they did one of their last flybys through deep into the plumes? We found the hydrogen. So now, where are we? Here's Enceladus's case for being the top science result of the mission, right? We've got active cryovolcanism, icy jets, source of the E-ring, organics, salt grains, global salty ocean, hydrothermal vents, right? Profound astrobiological interest. So yeah, over the course of the years, Enceladus has made a good case for the, the second uh, best result of the mission. And, and I can't argue with that. That's pretty incredible. And we should be going back to both of these moons. Both of these moons are worthy of follow-up missions. OK, let me look at my watch. Even me talking fast, I did not talk fast enough. OK, um, so here we are, right, at the end of the Cassini mission. This was a nice uh, summary that was put together ad when we had been there 10 years. In 10 years at Saturn, here's our top results. And you'll notice it's sort of like, you know, Titan, Enceladus. OK, the rings are in there too. Titan and so, you know, so, so they're, they're kind of, but there's a lot of other stuff going on. There's a lot of Saturn's rings. There's a lot of giant storms. And uh, we haven't put together our final mission list yet. You might say, well, it's been almost, you know, eight or nine months. What are you guys doing? Why don't you have your top <laughs> 10 list? David Letterman can do them like every night, you know. Um, so the reason for that is because we had these unbelievable orbits uh, at the end of the mission. And I'd like to talk to you about them a little bit. And then maybe in a year or two, I could come back and give you the actual top 10 list. I, I'm pretty sure uh, Titan and Enceladus will still be one, too. <clears throat> so the Cassini grand finale was incredible. As Janet said, when I, uh, I had gone away from Cassini a little bit, I still did the Titan work. But when I came back, they asked me to be the key strategic planner for this end of mission science. And it was truly a privilege and, a, and a, an incredible ride uh, to be part of this. We had had from our navigators a, um, you know, we have a mission that has to end. We are running out of fuel. We had started with thousands of kilograms of fuel, and now we are down to 20. No, sorry, now we're down to two plus or minus 20, okay? <laughs> Basically, every time we step on the gas, we don't know if there's gas in the tank, okay? Now, we have a backup plan because we have thrusters, so we have a backup plan. But every time we stepped on the gas for the last year, it was like, well, today may be the day we find out we have no fuel. Um, we, have, we have two incredibly, incredibly rich astrobiological targets. There is no way that we should be crashing Titan into either of those bodies and taking our Earth bugs to either of those bodies. So we have to dispose of the spacecraft. We have to. It's a requirement. And we have to dispose of the spacecraft uh, without hitting either of those. So the navigators came up with just incredible, incredible. Uh, this is just a repeat of why it's awesome, right? There's plumes, organics, liquid, nothing, organic, right? OK. Here's our trajectory for the last seven years. There's a little yarns ball of, of like a rat's nest there. Uh, then here are these final orbits. These are called the F-ring, or ring grazing and proximal orbits. We're orbiting high, right? So we're not orbiting in the plane of Saturn. We're orbiting high. And as we go out to, oh, what was that? Yeah, OK. It came back. Let's hope that doesn't happen again. Um, so these orbits here, the white ones are on the outside. And then we have a non-targeted Titan that jumps the rings. And we plunge the spacecraft in between the planet and the rings. This is incredible. This, the, when the tour designers told us this was a, an option, I think the, the scientists, they were giddy with the sort of the science that you can do when you could get this close to Titan, or sorry, <laughs> Saturn, right? We've always been too far away. If we can just get closer, there's science we can do that we've never been able to do in the 13 years uh, of our mission. So of course, we're going to you know, dispose of the spacecraft. We have to do that. That's a requirement. But there are three pieces of unique science. The first one is Saturn's internal structure. 
Saturn's interior, it's a giant gas planet, should be probably similar to Jupiter, but we don't know. We've never been able to get close enough to have radio science probe that, but if we can just get inside the planet in the rings, we'll be able to separate out the, the signature from the rings and the signature from the planet. We'll be able to get close enough and it'll tell us something about Saturn's interior. Awesome. Right at the end, we get something fundamental and basic about Saturn. I mean, right now, we don't know what the length of Saturn's day is. It's 10-ish hours, you know. That's a bad thing. You're there for 13 years, you don't know the length of the day. What are you doing, right? So, so we have like this incredibly important piece of science. But that's not it. There's a second one. After all these years, every occultation we've done, everything we've done to study the rings, we have never been able to penetrate the B ring right in here. It's too thick. Solar occultations won't do it. Stellar occultations won't do it. Inclined occultations, straight on occultations, we can't do it. And if you can't get the mass of the B ring, you can't get the mass of the rings. And if you can't get the mass of the rings, you can't get the age of the rings. You've been orbiting Saturn for 13 years, you don't know the age of the rings, what are you doing, right? So, and it's just, it's not our fault. <laughs> we couldn't get the data that we needed, but if we can get these orbits where we're in between the planet and the rings, then the mass of the rings is pulling separately from the mass of the planet, and we'll be able to get you that. So that's number two. Number three, we have an ion and neutral mass spectrometer. It was designed to go through Titan's atmosphere, but if you're flying that close to Saturn, why wouldn't you swoop into Saturn's atmosphere and take a sample of the top of Saturn's atmosphere? Of course you do that. Totally unique science. And the fact that you get the best images of the mission, yeah, okay, that's good. You know, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm not gonna poo-poo that. That's pretty exciting. Um, but that's three incredible pieces of science that you can get. Okay, so we did that. Starting in April of last year, we started these orbits once every week. We would do another of these orbits and we'd plunge in between and sometimes we'd study the rings and sometimes we'd study Saturn and sometimes we'd do the gravity and it was just crazy. It was like every week something incredible was happening. And one of the pleasures of being somebody who does planning, science planning for a mission, uh, it's always great when the scientists do their science and then they say, oh, I figured it out. The answer is, right? There's wispy terrain on Dione. <gasps> that sounds very exotic. That's uh, cracks. Okay, that's cool. Glad we knocked that down, right? Cracks on Dione. Um, but when scientists say, not Eureka, I found it, but huh, that's funny. Well, that means there's more work to be done, right? That's, that's where the puzzle is. That's where the puzzle solving comes from. And I'll tell you, it happened over and over in these 22 weeks, right? The icy satellites experts had, I mean, these are the kind of images they're getting. These, these look like no moons that you've seen before, right? These don't look like our moon. They don't look like Titan. They're not, they're shaped like UFOs for God's sakes, you know? It's got a little like, you know, I think is this, oh no, I, I used to have a little pasta picture that looked just like pasta, right? You know, uh, you know these moons are, are affecting the rings and we're getting these close up images. You can see here's Daphnis as it goes by the rings and it's pulling, you can even see a little bit of material that is gravitationally pulling off the rings there. We were very afraid of the dust. We'd never been in between the planet and the rings before. There was a huge effort to figure out where, is the dust gonna kill us? There was, there was a possibility we would do that first one in April of last year and we would die and then it was like, okay, if that's the case, that's the case. I mean, going out in a blaze of glory, sometimes it's a blaze of glory, right? <laughs> so, uh, but it turns out we were totally afraid of something that wasn't real, right? You can't even see the dust signal. I put, we put ring plane crossing here to help you see where the dust should be because you can't see it. Uh, this is the outside of the F ring. It's easy to see where the dust is out there. So you can see why we were worried about it. This is our first movie close up. This happened on that first night. World's leading expert in Saturn's atmosphere, looking at the highest resolution images ever to be seen. And he says, huh, I don't know what that is. I don't know what that is either. Nope, I have no idea. And I'm sitting in the back of the room going, score, please. <laughs> and, you know, we did two of those noodles. Uh, we got some of our highest resolution images of the rings. Incredible. So the, the, just the ripples, the, the depth to which you can see what's going on here, or where you have this straw that, you know, that is almost inexplicable, although they're working on it. You know, it's just the ring pictures from that time were incredible. Um, we got to see the South Pole. This is, uh, this is Saturn here. These are stars. This is a lot. So this is the Aurora, 
over the South Pole. Yeah, it was, that was a hard observation to get. We were really glad to get that one. Since we're going in between the planet and the rings, we took a picture, a movie. We took a movie of us sinking behind the rings of Saturn. There's no scientific value to that movie, right? That, that is a movie that speaks to the humanity in us, right? That is just cool. The fact that we named it after Star Wars stuff is cooler still. <laughs> <laughs> that was the press. Yeah, uh, that was the press release. A few orbits ago, in a ring system not too far away. I'm just saying. Yeah. yeah. And we were able to complete our family portrait. Uh, we had been able to take pictures of almost all of the bodies in the solar system. I think we were just missing Neptune, so we were able to to take the family portrait. Uh, this is what this what these bodies look like from Saturn's orbit with cameras like ours. Uh, the Cassini's final day uh, was a was a gift. Um, at this point, we've done 22 of these orbits. The dust has not affected us one bit, not one harmful hit from dust. We were worried about Saturn's atmosphere. We had about a factor of three uncertainty on it, and that was a good factor of three to hold. That was exactly almost what we saw. It's a factor of three uncertainty. So when the scientists came in and said, eh, about a factor of three, that wasn't so bad. Uh, but so we never tumbled. Um, we never saved. The magnetometer didn't reset. The magnetometer had been resetting like every two months for years and for 22 orbits, 22 weeks, it didn't reset once. Unbelievable. So on that last day, uh, we took a picture, a mosaic of the Saturn system. We also took our last Titan meteorological campaign picture, uh, looking down on the surface of Titan. Uh, we spent a little bit of time looking at some very specific things in the rings. We watched Enceladus set behind Saturn. The nice thing about this final day, if you think about it, you go back to that first slide, and what did I mention were the five big things, right, you go after. You go after the Saturn system. You would go after Titan. You would go after the rings. You would go after the ISIS atoms. Of course, we're measuring some of the closest uh, magne magnetic data and mag magnetospheric data of the whole mission, right, as we plunge into Saturn. So. They got their gold also at the end of the rainbow. Um, this is the last Titan picture we took. And there's Croc and Mari up there. No clouds. That's the Saturn mosaic that we took on the last day of the mission. This is a VIMS picture of, of Saturn. Uh, this is a picture right in here. Uh, 12, 10, uh, 10 hours before we crashed. Remember, Saturn rotates once in about 10 and a half hours. Uh, so this is where we crashed. Right there. Enceladus sat behind Saturn. Setting, I should say, setting. See, English, I'm so good with the English. You know. Setting behind Saturn. And then that's the last picture. Cassini's final image, you can see the, the uh, planet itself and some of the, the D-ring there. And I love to end with this cartoon. This cartoon makes me smile each time. So Cassini, I hear you're retiring in September 2017. Congrats, how do you want to celebrate? Maybe do lunch with me and all my moon sometime. And no, nah, I'll just go barreling straight into your atmosphere, learning as much as I can before I'm crushed to death and vaporized a spectacular whirling inferno beneath your mysterious stormy clouds. Saturn reacts appropriately. <laughs> and with that, I will uh, call, I will stop here. Um, wait, let me see what the next slide is. Yeah. And I will take questions. That's a boring slide. We need to like be on a more exciting slide. Okay, not that. Oh, this is good. Oh, wait. Uh, I do want to do. Well, okay, first I'm going to take questions, but could you get this set up for audio? Because, uh, or I could hold the microphone down. That's fine too. It's up to you. Okay, well I'll do that too, but then I'll play it here in the room when the time comes. This is a great video. Because uh, that last orbit, you know, we've been orbiting in between the planet and the rings 22 times, and then we had a non-targeted Titan that diverted us into Saturn's atmosphere. And on September 15th of last year is when we crashed into, to, into Saturn. And um, this is a great video about that. But first, I will take questions. You want to pump up the lights a little bit so I can see the audience? See if there's any questions out there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then there were more at mm -hmm. the mission. What was the sacrifice uh, to go more into detail in the intelligence? The other icy satellites. So we, we got two of Rhea. Ultimately, we got 20 Enceladus, right? We had, ultimately, we had 127 uh, sat, uh, Titan. Uh, we had 20, 28 or 29 Enceladus. We had two or three Rhea, two or three Mimas. 
two or three diodes. So we have uh, unusual uh, decreases in signature right at the equator on each side of Rhea. Uh, there are some who are boldly calling it a ring system. Uh, I would say the jury's still a little bit out because we don't really know what it is, right? So uh, still a little bit more work to do there. But yeah, there's some definitely some interesting things going on on uh, Rhea and Dione. We're now seeing those signatures on Dione too. So another question back there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you show them a picture of like, the Yep. Daphnis. Daphnis, uh, very small, right? Uh, I want to say, I'm going to guess Daphnis, okay. Is it 150 or is it 15? Hmm. I should know that. That's like an order of magnitude. I'm going to guess, Huh, I'm going to guess in the middle of that. It's somewhere like 100 uh, miles across, something like that. Might be a little bit smaller. Probably somebody could find it on Google faster than my brain will deliver this piece of information. But it's very small. Like our moon is huge, right? And that's very, very small. So it's about the size of a city. So, uh, yeah, so it gets very tricky, just like the definition of a planet gets very tricky. There are 63 defined moons around Saturn, but there's really only a dozen that matter that are circular and that hold their own gravity and, and have pulled themselves into a, into a ball. Um, there are a lot of called ring moons, Atlas, Daphnis, uh, uh, Pandora, those are all ring moons. Uh, so there's a, a vigorous debate, is it a moon or is it a ring moon or is it a, so uh, those, those debates will continue. Uh, so there's a part of the community that says if you're affecting the rings of Saturn and you're a ring moon, a part of the community says if you're embedded in the rings, you're a ring moon. So, you know, those debates will continue. It's mo it is a little bit just of a naming idiosyncrasy. But in general, we would say Saturn has over 60 moons, but there's only a dozen that really matter. Yeah? What's on the horizon for you? Uh, for me personally, so... oh. <laughs> okay. Uh, then you'll have to rephrase that question for, for JPL. What is on the horizon for JPL in the coming years? Excellent. So, uh, so NASA, uh, yeah, NASA splits their um, pot of money into three bins. They have the big bin, which is the flagship missions, and those are directed. They direct JPL to do a mission to Saturn. They direct Goddard to do a Hubble's, uh, the James Webb Telescope. Those are directed missions. Then there's the small missions, those are PIs, single scientists. He or she gets a team together. They compete every couple of years to win the competition for, to go wherever they want to go to do whatever they want to do, right? It is completely free. They just have to win the competition. And they get about $500 million. Uh, well, don't laugh. Yeah, look, don't laugh. That's not, that's not a bad sum of money. Yeah, so uh, it's a pretty stiff competition. Uh, the most recent one that you'd be familiar with is Insight. Insight won the Discovery competition a few years ago, and they just launched from Vandenberg last week, and they're on their way to Mars, and they're going to do uh, geology, um, or sorry, not geology, seismometry. That's their big thing is the interior of Mars. Um, the middle uh, pot is a little bit more interesting. Well, no, that's not true. The middle pot is just different. Uh, again, it's a PI, he or she pulls a team together, uh, and they will get a billion dollars but they don't get to go anywhere and do anything, okay? Every 10 years, all the scientists get together, all the planetary scientists, they get together with the National Science Academy and NASA, and they have a roadmap for the next 10 years. And with supposedly no horses in the race, even though they all have their little pet missions, um, they all decide what are the top five destinations, ones that will truly influence what we know about the universe, something that really matters. Those five targets become the opportunity you can win a billion dollars if you're going to address one of those. Those are called New Frontiers missions. The most recent one you might have been familiar with is Juno. It's in orbit around Jupiter right now. Or the New Horizons mission that went to Pluto. Those are both New Frontiers missions. So that's what's uh, ahead of us. We've got a couple of, we've got uh, two missions that are in phase two for, new, for the next New Frontiers call. One of, I'm not biased, but I'm telling you, one of them is a quadcopter on Titan. Yeah, I know, exactly, that's very cool. <laughs> it's not out of JPL, it's out of APL, but I don't care. Um, that's gonna be a cool mission, and it's up against some comet thing with Steve Squires. Yeah, that's, that's gonna be good, I'm sure. Very low risk, 
blah, blah, blah. They're going back to the comment that Rosetta did. I mean, I'm sure it's exciting. I'm sure it's exciting. <laughs> but I mean, it's up against a quadcopter Titan. Now, probably the quadcopter will lose because it's just so cool, but that means it's just so unknown, right? There's so many risks with that. And headquarters hates to risk a billion dollars. I would be like, God, if I had a billion dollars, I would give it to you to risk, you know? That would be me, but. Yeah, yeah, here's how. Yeah. So uh, when the spacecraft dies, that's considered the end of phase E, end of operations. And then the next phase, which is phase F, which is the last phase of the mission, is called closeout. The closeout is the phase of the mission we're in right now. And basically in closeout, what you're supposed to do is write the final report. To give you some sense of it, the Galileo final report was three volumes and sits on my bookcase about four inches. The Cassini uh, final report is currently seven volumes and counting. Oh <sighs> And they kept like people like me around to help write it. And you want to know how good I am at writing? Let's say not very good. Yeah, speaking, public speaking, yeah, send me there. <laughs> but writing, oh, it's a real challenge. So uh, we're doing that. We're also, we, we've shipped equipment all over the world. We need to bring that back. We need to, you know, the government doesn't like you to just, you know, spend a, a million dollars in equipment and then just leave it in, you know, Germany. <laughs> so, so we have to bring all that back. Uh, also, we're funding the scientists for another year or two, to, to, especially because these grand finale orbits are so incredible, right? They were so incredible. Um, so there's just a ton to do there. And then also, we kind of need to collect the archive of material that will help future scientists for decades, right? We know there's going to be decades of science that are done. We haven't even been able, we've been on the you know, we've been on the ride for 13 years. You don't have a chance to take a breath and look at the whole sweep of data that you have. There are papers that are going to come that are going to blow us away because now the scientists have some chance to think about it. Look at the papers that still come from the Galileo data, the Voyager data. I mean, when people have a chance to sit and think about it and puzzle things out. Uh, Cassini is, uh, is incredibly rich, the data set that we're leaving for future scientists. And there will li we already have 4,000 publications. There will be 4,000 more before I retire on Cassini. Next question? Yeah, go ahead. Little chips of water, ice covered in. Uh, no, you're better off to think of it as a chip of a water ice, so a little chip off an ice cube, right? Because it's going to be, it's so cold, it's hard. It's very little chance that it's porous and fluffy, like, a, like snow. Much more that it's a chip off an ice cube, right? That was the last image. The last data we got was the ion and neutral mass spectrometer who was telling us every second, every second it was telling us what atmosphere of Saturn it was seeing. And by the way, Cassini is not designed to be a real-time Saturn probe. That's not the way it's designed. We, had, we almost had to reprogram her to do this, but we didn't. We just had to be very, very clever in our commanding. And literally every moment that the ion and neutral mass spectrometer had a package of information, we, we worked it out so that it would move through the system immediately and get shot out the horn. And so we got data down to the last second from ion and neutral. So it's telling us about the composition of the atmosphere. And the last, of course, got deeper than anything else. But remember, we still only probed the very, very top. Uh, all the science results from the grand finale uh, have not been published yet because, well, first of all, all the scientists are distracted by closeout, which they hate. But there's a whole series of science uh, publications that are going to come out probably in the next month. I think there's a GRL. Um, yeah, I think, I think it's almost 80 articles that are finally going to hit the streets in about an, another month or so. So what ultimately Lack of fuel. We're running out of fuel. Oh. Yep. So there's nothing we could do. Oh, well, no, well, okay. So there, I, I, I embedded a lot of my answer there. What ultimately killed the spacecraft was us. We commanded it to kill itself, okay? Which is horrible, but it, it had to happen. We were running out. And so then it was screaming into the atmosphere at 75,000 miles an hour. And between hitting, by the time it hit the top of the atmosphere to within one minute later, it had tumbled out of control. And one minute later, it had been crushed and melted and pulled apart and destroyed. In fact, that's what the little movie's about. I'll show it to you. Ta-da, yeah. Ta yeah. In fact, that's a really good segue. Let me look at the time. We're running over here. Uh, show you a little movie here.
a lone explorer. On a mission to reveal the grandeur of Saturn, its rings and moons. After 20 years in space, NASA's Cassini spacecraft is running out of fuel. And so, to protect moons of Saturn that could have conditions suitable for life, a spectacular end has been planned for this long-lived traveler from Earth. In 2004, following a seven-year journey through the solar system, Cassini arrived at Saturn. The SOI burn attitude or pointing position, light up the rockets. The spacecraft carried a passenger, the European Huygens probe, the first human-made object to land on a world in the distant outer solar system. For over a decade, Cassini has shared the wonders of Saturn and its family of icy moons, taking us to astounding worlds where methane rivers run to a methane sea, where jets of ice and gas are blasting material into space from a liquid water ocean that might harbor the ingredients for life. And Saturn a giant world ruled by raging storms and delicate harmonies of gravity. Now, Cassini has one last daring assignment. Cassini's grand finale is a brand new adventure. 22 dives through the space between Saturn and its rings. As it repeatedly braves this unexplored region, Cassini seeks new insights about the origins of the rings and the nature of the planet's interior, closer to Saturn than ever before. On the final orbit, Cassini will plunge into Saturn, fighting to keep its antenna pointed at Earth as it transmits its farewell. In the skies of Saturn, the journey ends as Cassini becomes part of the planet itself. And you just can't end with anything better than that. Thank you all for coming. Well